What's up friends? In this video we're going to look at what it's going to be like in the kingdom of God during the millennial reign or the thousand year reign of Christ or the messianic reign, whatever you want to call it. But first let's establish what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is physical or, or the kingdom of God will be physical. The kingdom of God will be here on earth when it comes. Uh, and we can see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Okay, so this is after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, and he is with his disciples for 40 days teaching them about the kingdom of God, specifically, explicitly talking to them about the kingdom of God. And now let's skip down to verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now let's look at Jesus' response to that question in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. So Jesus, who we see elsewhere in the Gospels, has no problem with correcting or rebuking people, doesn't correct them here. They ask him, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, everything that you've been teaching us and talking to us about for the last 40 days, are you going to do that now? Is that going to start now? And what's Jesus' response? He says, don't worry about the times. Uh, he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't correct them. He doesn't go, oh man, you guys missed it. You guys still don't understand what I've been teaching you about for the last 40 days or what the prophets, all the prophets were talking about in, in, in our Bible? He doesn't say that. And in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says that he rebukes and disciplines those he loves. And he rebukes Peter, arguably his best friend, harshly. He says, get behind me, Satan, because Peter was being selfish and had the things of men in his mind and not the things of God. And he was distracting and tempting Jesus away from the will of God. Um, and so he rebukes him, but he doesn't rebuke the disciples here. He doesn't correct them. Um, another thing that we need to realize about the kingdom of God is that we enter into it or we inherit it. It's something that we enter into or inherit. It's not something that enters into us. It's not some secret spiritual kingdom in our hearts. Um, and we could see that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Okay, so right here in this passage, we see that the kingdom is tangible. It's an inheritance that we take. And this doesn't happen until Jesus returns, because the context of this verse is found in verse 31. So let me read that real quick. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. So this is after Jesus returns, sets up his throne, establishes his kingdom, and begins his reign. That he says to his followers, the king says to them, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So the kingdom is physical, it's tangible, and it's yet future. Um, it's something that will come and we will be able to enter into it and inherit it. Um, let's look at Zechariah chapter 14 verse 9. It says this, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. Excuse me. So we know that that hasn't happened yet because um, there's lots of different idols and gods and lords and there's other names. And Jesus isn't the king over the whole earth yet. So that is yet future. It's coming. It hasn't happened yet. Um, and you can't have a kingdom without the king. That's kind of obvious. But and vice versa. You can't have the kingdom without the king. You can't have the king without the kingdom. Now, some this is where some will say, well, Jesus is my king now. And 
I agree with you, except if the kingdom of God is now, then the kingdom of God sucks. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. So we live a life now worthy of the gospel, worthy of entering into the kingdom. Um, let's look at Acts chapter 14, verse 22 real quick. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 21. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystria, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. All right, so there it is again, the language of entering into the kingdom of God. And um, that kind of just gives us an idea of... Uh, living a life worthy of entering into the kingdom, that we have to endure many hardships. But also, that's what the Beatitudes is all about. Uh, you know, the upside-down, uh, counter-cultural lifestyle of the kingdom. And so we demonstrate the nature of the coming kingdom, what the kingdom will be like now with our words and our deeds, right? With our, our actions, our behaviors, our attitudes, our decisions, these um, should all demonstrate the ways of the kingdom. Our lives and our lifestyles should look like people um, that will be in the kingdom, like the citizens of the kingdom of God. Um, and we should, you know, live lives that um, we should walk in the ways of the kingdom. So we walk in the ways of the kingdom now as if we are already in the kingdom. And let me give you something um, that is just food for thought, but Jesus and the disciples, they preached the message of the kingdom before Jesus was ever crucified and resurrected. And I just share that now because some say, you know, that uh, the kingdom of God enters into your heart uh, upon conversion. When you first Put your faith and trust in Jesus as king. When you believe him to be Lord, that's when you enter into the kingdom. Um, and that doesn't work with the truth and reality that Jesus and the disciples both said, you know, repent, turn from your sins, and believe the good news of the kingdom before he ever went to the cross and before he ever resurrected. All right, so now, what is the kingdom of God going to be like? And this is more or less along the lines of what the disciples would have been talking about when they preached the message of the kingdom. And it's important that um, our message that we teach and preach lines up with what the Bible teaches. And I think that we should want our message to be the same message that Jesus and the disciples taught, which is the message of the kingdom of God. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And so we are just going to be um, kind of scratching the surface here. This is kind of just the tip of the iceberg, but I just want to give you the beginning of framework for this concept and this idea of the kingdom of God. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, Micah chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. Um, but before we do that, I want to let you know that Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 4, is identical with Micah chapter 4, verse 2 and 4. So there's a couple reasons for that, a couple um, possible reasons um, that they're identical that, that I think. And it's either that the word of the Lord that came to Micah is the exact same word of the Lord that came to Isaiah, and they both received the same message from Revelation, and God just wanted them to repeat um, I, the exact same word. So it's either that or Micah um, read the writings of the prophet Isaiah and was familiar with what Isaiah um, talked about. And then when he went to prophesy and write down um, his prophecies, uh, the Spirit reminded Micah of what he read in Isaiah and inspired him to write down word for word exactly what Isaiah had previously prophesied. So those I think are the two best um, possibilities for why these two passages, Isaiah chapter 2, uh, verse 2 through 4, and Micah chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, are identical. 
word for word, except for I think one of the prophets says peoples and the other prophet says nations. Um, so, but that's the only difference. Besides that, they're identical. Anyways, um, enough of that. Let's look at Micah chapter 4 to see what it's going to be like in the kingdom during the millennial reign. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many nations and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All right, so um, there it is again that we walk in the ways of the kingdom now, and we will still walk in the ways of the kingdom then. We, we saw that in this passage, but then also what we see uh, to put it simply, is that there is world peace. And I know that that's very beauty pageant, um, but that's what's going on here. There's no more war. And that is good news. That's very good news that there isn't going to be a need for militaries to defend nations anymore because there's not going to be any opposing or invading um, nations with their militaries because uh, it's going to be world peace. Uh, King Jesus will be on the throne and he, he's going to be reigning and ruling over the earth. Uh, so it's going to be world peace and no more war, which um, I think is better news for um, people who aren't Americans. It hits different for non-Americans because for us Americans, we've, well, I'll just speak for myself. I've lived my whole life in peace and safety and security. I haven't, besides 9-11, um, I've never been, you know, afraid of invading nations or um, wars here in our land, you know, that here on our turf that there's going to be war. So when people in the Middle East, or let's say, um, let's use the Ukrainians for example, when a Ukrainian reads this passage, that's going to hit different for them. You know what I mean? And people in the Middle East, uh, let's, let's contrast Americans with um, Israelis, people in Israel. People living in Israel today, they could be going about their lives and then all of a sudden an alarm sounds, an alarm goes off, and it's to alert the people that there is a potential threat of uh, an inbound rocket or missile. So take shelter, run to um, a bomb shelter or a bunker or something like that. They have to live with that constant reality because um, their surrounding neighbors are terrorists and they hate the, the Jewish people, they hate um, the Israelis and the surrounding nations just want to wipe them off the map. And so they have done terrorist attacks against Israelis and the citizens of Israel uh, for years and years and years and years. And uh, thankfully, there's this technology that they have called, I believe it's called the Iron Dome, and it is um, this uh, military defense technology that is able to shoot down um, incoming rockets and miss missiles with rockets. So it's able to detect incoming missiles and rockets and if they're going to land where civilians live then a rocket will be shot up to blow that rocket up before it ever hits but if it's just going to uh, land in an abandoned field where there's no civilians then they just let it land and that um, defensive system has um, shot down thousands of rockets so anyways that is just a um, quick little reality of what it's like for people in israel and other nations in the Middle East, they live with constant threat and reality that um, there's terrorists that don't like us and they take action against us. You know, there's terrorist attacks 
um, that can can happen to us and there's nations that can invade us and there's um, just always this looming possibility of war in their land and that's not the case for us Americans so when they read this passage that you know is really good news that there's coming a day um, that that will no longer be a reality that there will be no more war uh, and then we see that we are going to own our own land and pieces of property right and then there won't be a threat of anyone taking it away from us um, let me read it again it says that every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree and no one will make them afraid so there's not going to be any more tyranny or oppression or injustice none of that in the kingdom of god all right let's um, go to isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 real quick of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. All right, so we see more of the same there, that there's going to be world peace. Um, and we see that there will be one world government, um, but it's going to be the government of God. So I guess there is going to be a new world order. But thankfully, it's going to be uh, the order of, of uh, Jesus. And so what we see here is the government of God and that there's under um, or in God's government, there's going to be nothing but peace and prosperity and righteousness and justice. Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, what we see going on in this passage is that the nature of animals has been restored to their original state as it was in the Garden of Eden. And I love this passage. It's, it's just so beautiful. But um, the, the nature of animals, um, them being violent towards each other and towards us, um, didn't change until after the flood. Because in the beginning, we see that the Lord God gave all the trees and the plants of the earth as food for all the animals and for us as well. So animals were herbivores and vegetarians, if you will, until after the flood. And then we see that um, God says something along the lines of, uh, if you know animals spill each other's blood, then there's gonna need to be an account for that. Um, so I don't know why uh, God changed their nature um, I just know that he did, um, which it makes sense, though, that, um, you know, Adam was able, Adam and Eve were able to hang out with the animals and he was able to name all the animals. And then Noah was able to get all the animals on the ark and all the animals that got on the ark came off of the ark. They survived. They didn't devour each other and eat each other while they were on the ark because they were still herbivores in their nature towards each other didn't become violent. The whole predator and prey dynamic um, didn't become a thing in their relationship with each other yet until after the flood. So that's how, uh, you know, foxes and rabbits are able to be uh, on the ark with each other and lions and gazelles and they didn't devour and eat each other. Um, and so in the kingdom of God, that's going to be restored. And we see the beauty of, you know, kids being able to hang out with uh, lions and bears and cobra snakes and not fear um, the danger of them or the threat of the violence. You know, they're, they're not gonna harm or destroy anymore. So that's uh, something really beautiful, I think, that's gonna, that we have to look forward to in the kingdom of God. Um, and let's go to Isaiah chapter 65, starting in verse 21 now. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. 
For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. But the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So there it is again. The prophet Isaiah using the same language that he used in earlier prophecies that we just read. Um, and it's the Lord trying to get, you know, a message across to us, trying to make it clear that, look, this is how animals will be in the kingdom of God. Their nature will be restored um, to a gentle nature. Even lions and wolves and snakes, they won't be violent they won't be a threat to you anymore they will be herbivores and vegetarian again they will eat straw you know the lion will eat straw like the ox but i read this passage um, because i wanted to highlight how it says they will build houses and dwell in them so we kind of already looked at this in micah but um, there's going to be architecture there's going to be building in the kingdom of god there's going to be gardening and farming and there won't be any more injustice where you know we build houses and others live in them, or we, um, you know, grow food and others eat it. There won't be any oppression or, or tyranny like that anymore. And we see that we will uh, own our own homes and live in them. We'll own pieces of land and property. And like I said, there's going to be farming and gardening and building, and we're going to be working in the kingdom of God. And uh, work actually is a good thing. It's a good thing now, and work came before the fall, before sin and rebellion and disobedience um, against God. There was work, um, and God gave work to man as purpose, and with purpose comes fulfillment, with fulfillment comes joy, and this passage said that we will long enjoy the works of our hands. Um, the only difference between work now and the kingdom uh, and work in the kingdom of God is that it's not going to be toilsome anymore. Um, when we work, we're just going to totally enjoy it, which we can enjoy work now, but we won't um, get tired or fatigued. Our feet won't start to hurt, and our, back, our backs won't be achy, and we won't get sore anymore because we'll have resurrected bodies in the kingdom of God, which I made a video about, so if you're interested in that topic and want to hear more about it, then check that video out. Um, but there's going to be work and building in the kingdom of God. And now I want to read one more passage that is pretty much saying the same thing as this, and that is Amos, or Amos, however you pronounce it, chapter 9, verse 13 and 15, and that will be it for this video. The days are coming declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Okay, so here we see that there's going to be eating and drinking in the kingdom of God during the millennial reign. And that means um, once you put all of these passages of scripture together, um, that life in the kingdom of God is going to be a lot like life now. The way we experience life here and now, through our senses, through um, tasting and smelling and hearing and seeing and feeling is how we will experience life in the kingdom of God. So the way life is now, the way that we experience life and reality now is how it's going to be in the kingdom of God, just way better without all the evil, without all the injustice and oppression. It's going to be nothing but righteousness and peace and justice and we will get to build and work and plant and garden. All of those things, all of those good things is just a glimpse of what it will be like in the kingdom of God. So until the next video, grace and peace.